Mm. Also, please bear with me. I've got a bad cold. When I left New York today, there was a snowstorm, but I had the cold before the snowstorm. But anyway, it's nice to be here in New Orleans. Um, on the question of capitalism, democracy, and, and imperialism, we thought we'd start with a small subject and build from there, you know. Um, it seems to me that a very significant fact of our uh, social and political and personal lives is that we live in a capitalist system. People don't usually talk about it, and you're not supposed to talk about it, you say free enterprise, and we got that mess up. But it's very hard to really um, analyze phenomena accurately unless you bring in this dimension, this reality, that this is a capitalist system. And that means that the land, the labor, the resources, the capital, the technology of the society are used for a particular purpose. That purpose is the process of capital accumulation that is the function of the wealth, labor, capital, is to gather together and make more capital so that you can have profits which you invest to make more profits. This raises, this already solves an interesting mystery that has puzzled us for many years, which is why are we unable to solve our social problems? Why is it that with all this wealth, our cities are going into decay? With all this wealth, we still have 20% functional illiteracy. With all this wealth, our environment is being treated like a septic tank, and, and the quality of our water and air is, uh, is bad. With all this wealth, uh, the fastest growing social group in America are the poor, going from 24, from 25 million when Ronald Reagan came into office to 35, 34 million, 34.5 million. 10 million, 40% growth in five years, the fastest growing social group. With all this wealth, it's because the wealth is not being used or being directed toward our social problems. The wealth of our land is being used for the process of capital accumulation to accumulate still more wealth. The natural resources and the environment and the poor and the workers and the unemployed, et cetera, et cetera, they are all byproducts process. What is wealth, ladies and gentlemen? What is it? Wealth comes from two sources. One from the natural resources of the environment, you know, and what the land can produce, the sun gives to the land, the energy that's in there. And two, from the labor that goes into making that wealth into a marketable product, which can then be sold for a profit. Um, what, transforms, what transforms a, um, a, um, a tree into, into a marketable product, like a book, is the labor that goes into harvesting the timber, turning it into lumber, the building of the factory that then makes it into paper, and so forth, and the labor that goes into the writing and all that sort of thing, you see. Uh, human labor, labor power, is what creates wealth. And the way you get wealthy is by employing and enlisting the labor of other people. Not by working hard. Hard work rarely makes you wealthy. But by getting others to work hard for you. And the function then, uh, the essence of the capitalist system is that there's only one reason why you will be employed by a capitalist in a profit-making enterprise. And that is their anticipation that they can make money off your labor. Whether you're going to be working a, a drill press or a, a lathe, or whether you're in a corporate law office. A friend of mine works in the big New York insurance law office where they just specialize in insurance law and she gets paid oh well, she gets paid maybe forty dollars an hour uh, for her work very good pay uh, but her firm charges a hundred dollars an hour for her labor and they expropriate the other sixty dollars without doing anything and maybe let's take let's take ten of that off for overhead secretarial fees electricity whatever else a typewriter office rent um, they make, without working, without working, money off your labor, whether you wear a blue or a white collar. 
or whether you get a modest salary or a very elaborate salary. And you can be snuffed out. You can even be a manager of a company and you, and you run into early retirement policy. And as friends of mine find, at age 55, they're suddenly, or 60, they're snuffed out, and that's it. And their earning power takes a plunge, even though their living standard was at a certain level. That wealth, which is accumulated by people, <clears throat> by a small number of people, specifically the Mellons, the Morgans, the DuPonts, and the Rockefellers, and a few a number of others, the Hunts, the Lees, and the Murdochs, and uh, you know, Annenbergs, uh, and so forth. Um, that wealth is used for several purposes. One, for private consumption. The rich do not deny themselves. There are about three or four million people in America who, who don't work. They just live very well off the wealth of other people. Or they busy themselves with things like uh, running for president. Um, <laughs> Mrs. George Bush said it very well in the 1984 campaign. She said when the question of her husband's taxes came up and his earnings became a, 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 in the public eye, she said, yes, my husband and I are very rich. We like our wealth. We enjoy it. We're not ashamed, but we enjoy it. And I said, oh, she, she said it, you know. Was, we enjoy our wealth. Because the, the, the picture usually given to the ordinary populace is that the rich suffer, you know. They have burdens, responsibility, and this wealth is a... That's an onerous burden, and it's not something you'd really want to trade places with me. But somehow they never want to trade places with us. Um, <laughs> that's one thing they do. They they uh, use the money for their personal um, uh, for their personal happiness. Jay Rockefeller, now a Democrat and in the U.S. Senate, uh, when asked why did he have a million dollar home said, what's the difference, what the price of a home, whether it's a million dollars or 80,000 a year, I mean, what's the difference? It's a difference to him. He said, I love this home, it makes me happy. So that's what the, the DuPonts have about 24 personal estates in the state of Delaware alone. I didn't know there was room in the state of Delaware for 24 <laughs> estates. Um, and then they do something else. They take another portion of that wealth, which they have to, um, and they, um, reinvest it to realize it because capital has no meaning separate from labor. After all, when you make money, let's say you work for summer and you got a thousand dollars saved from that summer, that has no meaning. That has nothing. It's nothing. It's that's dead labor. That's your dead labor. It represents labor you've already done. It's, you, it, it loses value unless you put it back into something so that it can earn. What does it mean to put it back into something? Putting your money to work means mixing it back with living labor, which creates more surplus value, which you can expropriate a portion of. Capital doesn't produce anything. It is the thing that's produced by labor. You could be as rich as Rockefeller, have all his wealth, all his stocks, all his bonds, all his money. You can have wads of it, $1,000 bills in your pocket and you could not build this building. You could not build this lectern. Only human labor can do that. Capital produces nothing. It is the thing that's produced by labor. You may have noticed that when labor stops, like on a holiday or a weekend or in a strike, production stops. Nothing gets produced. Even though capitalists run ads in all the big newspapers and say capital works and they're putting your money to work and all sort of thing. So the capitalist must always find places to put his money. Just as you with your thousand dollars. You invest that thousand dollars. No, not me. I just put it in the bank and leave it there. That's what you're doing. What the hell do you think a bank is? Why would a bank give you five and a half or seven or eight percent? Only because they can then take that money and lend it out to someone else at 14 and 15 percent. And that person will pay 14 and 15 percent only because he can then use it and hire labor and make 25 and 30 percent off other people's labor. So there's a constant need to find places to put your money. The irony of the Rockefellers is they always need a new places to invest their money. They keep making money and have to put it into other things. I once saw an interview with um, 
the richest man in the world, John Paul Getty, de died now. He's a British journalist who didn't know anything about economics and said to him, Mr. Getty, why don't you just cash in all your money and, and just cash it all in and then lose it and all that. As if the guy was depriving himself. Here he was living in this mansion, sitting in a Louis XIV chair with the original, uh, original um, Raphael the Titian paintings up on the wall. And he said, cash all my, this is a guy who was making right a million dollars a day, Getty oil and other things. So what would I, what would I put into? So would you go down to your neighborhood bank with, with $40 billion and just deposit it in your neighborhood bank? <laughs> um, what would you put it into, you see? Because capital has to be put into living labor to recreate and continue to expand. Another portion of their, lay, of their capital, of that wealth they accumulate from our labor, is used to win them positions of power and celebrity and, and dominance. They become the trustees of our universities and our museums, our foundations. They control our media. They control, therefore, not only the food we eat and the clothes we wear and the air we breathe and the quality of the water we drink, but also the very images that go into our head. And they run for office or they pay handsome sums to those who run for office. When Henry Kissinger went to work for Richard Nixon as National Security Advisor, Nelson Rockefeller gave him $50,000. said, here, Henry, uh, to remind Henry who, whom he really belonged to, you see. And uh, because Kissinger was Rockefeller's protege. As a Harvard professor, he wrote the kind of books that Rockefeller liked. And Rockefeller brought him along as a special advisor, and that's what propelled him up there. You don't think it was his writing talent, do you? Um, and the senators, you know, when Rockefeller was being confirmed as vice president of the United States, remember he was appointed to vice presidency because Ford took over as president because both Agnew and Nixon were kicked out for being the crooks that they were, although neither of them went to jail as they should have. Um, Rockefeller was sitting there, and the senators asked him about this gift to, to uh, Kissinger. And these senators were really hard with Rockefeller. They said, uh, Why'd you do it, sir? Um, and, and, um, and Rockefeller said, why did you give us $50,000 to Kissinger? He said, he said, well, giving has always been a tradition in my family. <laughs> so there you have what it's about. The owning class, those who own the land, the labor, the resources of this society, Those who own this society, that Fortune 500, which is composed of a few giant conglomerates, which in turn are controlled by five or six major New York banks, which in turn are dominated by the Mellons, Morgans, Rockefellers, and DuPonts, that class controls also the political life, to a large extent, the political life of our country, because they occupy the high ground. They own the media of our country. The largest stockholder of NBC is Chase Manhattan Bank. The largest stockholder of CBS is Chase Manhattan Bank. The largest stockholder of ABC is Morgan Guaranteed Trust. Chase Manhattan is third. Um, the banks, these banks own about 70% of the major stock of the networks. They also control or have, play a preponderant influence over our democratic, uh, what we call our democracy, over our political life because they have these serviceable resources, the thing we're most familiar with. They give the big contributions to the candidates, they pay the fat lobbyists, they have the, the expertise, they can hire the technology, the skills, the guys who can keep a watch on, on how people are voting and what they're doing in a way which the rest of us who have to worry about paying our rent or getting from now till Friday um, uh, can't quite do. And thirdly, they, have, they, ha they predominate in another way in that this, they, they set the conditions of economic reality itself. That is, a capitalism is the economic reality to which state policy must respond. So when the government has to deal with economic problems, it has to deal with the economic problems of capitalism on capitalism's terms. It has to encourage investment. 
When the government talks about a viable economy, it's talking about a viable capitalist economy. So there's a whole set of grants and write-offs and export subsidies and um, research and development subsidies and equity subsidies of all kinds, which the government, billions of dollars which the government gives in a, a, a program called Welfare for the Rich, which Ronald Reagan hardly ever talks about when he talks about economizing in the government, and which those proponents of rugged individualism, self-reliance, and free enterprise hardly ever talk about either, as they live off your tax dollars. And that's your money they take. They take it not only when you're a worker, but then after you get it home, they take it again as a taxpayer. And when they take your money as a worker, and when they take your money as a taxpayer, they're not taking your money it's not your money they're taking, they're taking your life. That's your time, that's your sweat, that's your blood, that's your brains, that's your life you put into that. You're never gonna get that back. They expropriate that from you for the enrichment of their holdings and the enhancement of their power. People to buy its goods. Wages which are, uh, which are the thing that cut into profits must be held down maximize profits. The less I pay my workers, the more money I get for myself. But wages, which are the thing that keep demand up, which create markets, must be constantly kept up. So there's a constant tendency in capitalism toward overproduction or really underconsumption, toward recessions, toward boom and bust cycles, toward inflation as you jack up the prices as much as you can. Um, there are other contradictions also. One of the greatest contradictions, as far as I'm concerned, is the total absence of social, human, and spiritual values. I wrote for a religious magazine, an Episcopalian magazine called The Witness, called Capitalism, a System Without Spirit, um, which I argued that um, one of the great crimes of capitalism is that it's a system without spirit. There's no humanity in it. You don't produce things because a community might need it, unless they got the money for it. Need, remember, is never the imperative. You may need all sorts of things, but I do not respond as a producer to your needs. I may be sorry that you have these needs. I respond only to your demand. Demand is your need or want. It doesn't have to be a need. Your want plus buying power, which equals market demand. Then I come in because that's when I make money, and only then. And the thing that impels capitalism is, in fact, the ora sacra fami, right? The lust for gold. Um, you can destroy the environment. It's rational to do that. You know, why did Firestone Company build a factory on the Mill River in Connecticut and then dump raw industrial sewage into the Mill River to destroy a river that took nature a million years to construct an ecological marvel that was used for swimming, fishing, recreation, drinking water, and you just dump your raw industrial effusion into the river? It's rational to do that. It's correct policy because you have one value, and that value is to cut your production costs and maximize your profit. It's not rational from a human point of view. It's not rational from a social or ecological point of view, but capitalism has no commitment to humanity or social values or environment or spiritual values or self-dignity or literacy or education or medical care or any of those things or a right and guarantee to a job. Capitalism has only one loyalty, and that's to itself, to its own inner inevitable dynamic, which to invest and make a profit from your investment. Because it's the first law of capitalism that if you don't make a profit, you go out of business. And that's why they do it. Not because they're greedy or evil, although there's plenty of that too, greed and evil and venality and bribes and corruptions and lying and rip-offs. They got plenty of that too. It comes out in the papers every day. Not only because it's not but that, but that isn't essentially it. It's because that is the inevitable imperative of the system. You would have to do the same if you were president of that company, or your company would lapse into a condition of social philanthropy, which means it wouldn't last very long. <clears throat> so it is that absence of consideration of human values which many of us really kind of dislike about this system.
because we think it really ultimately, while it gives us more and more video games and more and more um, automobiles and more and more power lawn mowers and other things, um, it also is destroying the quality of our lives and the spirit of our lives and in a sense the essence of our humanity. Now the state which does and must do the bidding of the major capital formations in this society is not though merely just a tool for the ruling class. It is said that Marx said that the state is an executive committee of the bourgeoisie. He never said that. If you look at the manifesto closely, he, the quote is something else. He says the executive of the state is a committee of the bourgeoisie. But he does not rule out, and certainly Engels, who lived a little longer to see certain other things, did not rule out the possibility that the state, while it is an instrument whereby the property class controls uh, and defends itself against those who do not have wealth, and by the way, that's not a Marxian axiom. Adam Smith believed that, Aristotle said it, Plato said it, it goes right on up to James Madison, James Otis, um, um, theorists all through the centuries quite openly recognized that the function of the state, uh, the quotes I used in Democracy for the Few are from Adam Smith. They sound so radical, but they are from the father of, American, of, of, uh, of modern capitalism. Uh, 1776, Wealth of the Nations, he says the function of the state, the function of government is to protect those who have property and wealth from those who do not. And that's what it's, one of its functions. But it also can become an arena of democratic struggle. And what we've had then is not only class exploitation and class oppression, but we've had fight back. So you have class, you have class oppression, but you also have class struggle. And we have had over the last 200 years, the farmers and workers and women and minorities and others fighting and struggling for their rights, you see, and winning the right to vote and winning all sorts of other victories, none of which are sufficient, none of which will make us, make us or democracy secure. Uh, but we've won these important gains, and we shouldn't pretend that we haven't. There is a tendency among some radical writers on the left to overreact to the whitewash job that's done by the mainstream political scientists. Mainstream political science took every vice, every flaw in the system, and made a virtue out of it, and said, oh, uh, the Senate filibuster, well, that's really good because it gives the Senate time to think and not act rashly. Oh, uh, lobbying, oh, that's very good. They perform a beautiful information function, and this is really good. And I, they took everything, you know, everything. Oh, the Ku Klux Klan, well, this tests out tolerance. Oh, oh yeah, everything, everything was, you know. So in reaction to that kind of pap, that balderdash, harsh words, these, and in reaction to those things, <laughs> Uh, uh, we on the left often, and I think the first edition of Democracy for the Few shows more of that tendency than what I've tried to develop by the fourth edition. We took every virtue in the society and turned it into a vice and said, labor unions, they're a lot of baloney, they don't really do anything. Free speech, boy, you free speech if you talk in the closet. Uh, this, this, and so forth and so on. <coughs> the truth of the matter is there have been very real victories won by the democratic forces in this society. They have not been given to us by capitalism. When Colonel Mason of Virginia got up at the Constitutional Convention in 1787 in Philadelphia and he said, let's have a Bill of Rights, boys, that was voted down unanimously by the convention. They didn't want a Bill of Rights. They didn't want to deal with that. They, didn't want, they, they were saying there's an excess of democracy. We don't need that. We're building this elaborate structure of government to mute the impact uh, and dilute the impact of democratic forces. They only acceded to a Bill of Rights reluctantly when they realized they had overplayed their hand and they weren't going to get their constitution ratified unless they put it in. It was the threat of those democratic forces that made them concede a Bill of Rights. And that's the way it's been. And that's what history is about. And if you know that and nothing else, you know more than if you know everything else, but you don't know this. It is that, that nothing was ever given to you. The Founding Fathers didn't give you your rights. Women weren't given the right to vote. You always hear women were given the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. Women struggled for 100 years 
for a hundred years from the 1820s when they mobilized the first conventions. And by the way, the vote wasn't even their major demand. They had a whole host of demands which had to do with the treatment of women labor and child labor and property rights, inheritance rights, all that sort of thing, and legal rights. And women struggled for a hundred years. They agitated and marched and got arrested and, and beaten up and roughed up and chained themselves to the White House gates and got thrown into jail. Some of them died of pneumonia, force-fed and all that. And only after a hundred years of struggle, then they were given the vote in this great gradualist thing. You see, where well, we just discuss and we learn and we go along a little by. And workers were not given free trade unions. They had to fight for them. They had to fight against goon squads and Pinkerton detectives and terrorists and state militia and National Guard and U.S. Army. And that's how they got it, with their blood and their struggle. Struggle and conflict has been the essence of our history. You don't learn that part of it generally in history. You learn about this guy signing that and that, that and then he went to this stage. But there's another history in there, and that's the history of the people. The history of the people fighting for the democratic rights. And what we have won is inadequate. The vote is an inadequate measure against the power of plutocracy and money. Social security. A democratic victory is inadequate for protection and security in old age. Unemployment insurance is inadequate for the specter of joblessness which haunts and hurts millions of people, families in this country. The right to free speech, which we've extended, is inadequate. We have yet to win the right to hear these kind of opinions that you're hearing tonight on the major national networks because the power of property and power monopolizes. You can put on those networks and you can hear George Will and William Buckley and people of that sort, but you cannot hear persons of my persuasion. So, while these, all these rights are inadequate, they're not to be discounted, however. They're real democratic gains, and they become the basis for which we struggle further. <coughs> now, by the way, there's an interesting book, John E. Schwartz, without a T, S-C-H-W-A-R-Z, called America's Hidden Success. And he takes, um, he takes the mythology that's been propagated by conservatives over the years that uh, government efforts for poverty and government efforts in this area and government efforts are nothing. We've thrown billions at these problems and they haven't gotten better. And he points out that, in fact, when you do take a portion of your wealth and use it for the problems, it does help the problems. That, in fact, poverty was alleviated by the poverty programs, not solved. That, in fact, the Head Start programs and the CETA programs did help people. They got better jobs, better paying jobs. They ended up paying more taxes. They, in fact, were cost efficient. They paid for the cost of the programs. That, in fact, the campaigns, the government campaigns for pollution and air and water control did improve the quality of air and pollution. That, in fact, the private sector, with its boom and prosperity, did very little to reduce poverty that the prosperity of the private sector did not trickle down, that there happen to be millions of people in this country who cannot compete, like the elderly, the disabled, uh, children, others who are ill-equipped, who have, don't have marketable skills and who need to be given marketable skills. That is a great secret which isn't let out because if it were let out, then the private sector would have to admit that the public sector is not ineffectual and is not wasteful and such, you see? That in fact, it's better. You get closest to solving your problems when you take a certain portion of your money and direct them at those problems. Well, then when that money is totally monopolized for the capital accumulation process. That in fact, you can build a better railroad and run it. That Conrail came along and the U.S. government and the American taxpayer put up $6 billion to salvage and bail out Penn Central and seven other major Northeast, major, uh, Northeast um, rails, which, were, which had been milked by private capital, milked and run into the ground for the biggest possible profit, and their surplus in stock sold off just before the government took them on. And then they brought, in a, they brought in a very good railroad manager who put that thing back together again. 
on a nonprofit basis. And today, Conrail has uh, is worth. Um, last year, did five hundred million dollars in business. It has an eight hundred million dollar cash reserve. It's in the black. It's working well. It demonstrated that a government-run railroad is a better-run railroad, as the railroads of France and Sweden and Italy could demonstrate to any railroad in the US any time, any privately owned railroad. But it was demonstrated here. And that's why Ronald Reagan took Conrail and he sold it off. He sold it off for what amounts to $775 million, even though its stock, its whole total asset value is about $3 billion. He took what belongs to the people of the United States, a $3 billion railroad system, and he sold it off for what amounts to $775 million. The actual sale was 1.2, but when you, when you deduct, uh, well, it was 1.532, but when you deduct um, that $800, a million dollar cash, in effect, comes down to the figure I said, 775. He did it because he does not want that demonstrated. One of the things the corporate elites in this country do not want is to have it demonstrated that the people don't need their ripoff. That when you go into a room and you put on a light, you don't have to be paying a tariff to the Rockefellers or the DuPont utilities, private profit. You can have a publicly owned utility. In Burlington, Vermont, you have Burlington Light. It's owned by the people of the city of Burlington, Vermont. And last year, it had a surplus of a million dollars. That million dollars, if it were a private utility, would have gone to the coupon clippers and the stockholders who live in Boston and New York. Instead, it went right back into the budget in Burlington, Vermont. That's a bad example. That kind of thing, you want to sell it off. You want to give it back to the private sector, where it can be milked, where it can feed the capital accumulation process. And this is, what, this is what business has against government. One, it helps class interests other than ours, and it brings up their potential wages. And two, it demonstrates again and again that the public sector can do the things that we need for our human and our social values, not what they need for their capital accumulation process. <coughs> so there is, however, one form of government spending which the business community likes because it's like any other contract they would get. It's called military spending because it doesn't expand the nonprofit sector. It doesn't involve human services. It's a contract that comes in like, like uh, you might come in for, for automobiles. Instead, you're coming in for an M1 tank, OK? And it has certain very wonderful features about it. You know, the thing about military spending is that it's not wasteful, it's wonderful. The liberal critics who point out again and again that the military budget is riddled with duplication and waste don't understand something. I mean, they're right. It is riddled with duplication and waste. The Navy spends $511 for a light bulb that I could get for $1.50 in the supermarket. It's wasteful. Who's it wasteful for? Not for the guy who's selling the light bulbs. Not for the capital accumulation process. Not for capitalism. It's wonderful. It's not wasteful. And that's the wonders of defense spending. You have a whole area of capital investment which no longer competes with your civilian market. You see, if I'm making refrigerators and I'm selling them and I keep making more and selling them, making more, after a while, I begin to cut into my margin of profit per unit because I got the market with refrigerators. Now I can take all this money and I can put them into tanks, into planes, into missiles, which have, two a built-in obsolescence. We know soon to get one generation of weapons up there on the production line when, in fact, it becomes obsolete because we can d develop a new mechanism which can make it more accurate, so I have to build a whole new set. We get uh, duplication, that's fine. The Navy builds an F-111 fighter bomber, and the Army builds one, too. They're, uh, they're, they're duplicates. They cost, what, two, three billion dollars each to develop. Wasteful for you, the taxpayer. Wasteful from a social point of view. Wasteful from a human point of view. But remember what I said, capitalism has nothing to do with those things. Capitalism is about the capital accumulation process. For the contractors, it's a, it's a double bonanza. Guaranteed cost overruns. 
If some, a contractor comes to you and says, I'll build your house for $70,000, and when he builds it, he ends up giving you a tab. Here it is, $245,000. You're what? What are you kidding? You take him to court. He isn't going to get $245,000. But you know what the, the Pentagon does? Goes, oh, two hundred dollars oh, Sure, how much? Oh, 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 well, yeah. 300% cost overrun? Fine. 800%? Okay. Admiral Rickover pointed out that the Polaris submarine periscope had a 900% cost overrun, and the Pentagon just paid it out. That's okay. We got more where that comes from. At the end of every year, it's been pointed out, the Pentagon usually has four or five billion dollars. It's called the December spend, which they gotta spend out quick. They don't know what to do with it. Because if they're caught with a surplus, what does that mean? Congress will turn around and say, you're getting more money than you need. So they spend. I mean, spending, you spend it. Why not? Because there's a job waiting for you out there in that defense industry when you get out. Anyway, and twice the pay, plus your fat military pension. All of this complements of the taxpayer. All compliments of you. Those of you who have not yet gotten your first paycheck, if you've been working, and many of you already are working, part-time, whatever, or whatever you'll, you'll experience it. That day you get your first paycheck, and you look at it and you say, there must be some mistake. <laughs> and they say, no, there's no mistake. There's a flap on the other side, and you see those little boxes with all those numbers? That's where the rest of it went. It went to General Dynamics and Boeing and McDonald's. It's a great system. The first thing you do, the first thing capital does in, in trying to maintain its accumulation process level is to keep labor from, ac from having access to competing sources of income. Historically, the way you turn, the way you able to expropriate labor is by denying labor alternative sources of, in, of, of sustenance. So you drive them off the farmlands. The great enclosure acts of the late 1700s, which turned the British peasantry into a proletariat. People are not born workers, you see. You are driven into the hell holes of Manchester and Lancashire because the enclosure acts cut off the game, the firewood, the fruit the food that you have gotten, and so off you go. That process is going on all over the world. The process which Marx described is going on today. People say Karl Marx is not irrelevant. He's the wrong century. He's a 19th century theorist, and he doesn't explain 20th century phenomena. You're absolutely right. He isn't that irrelevant. The only thing you're wrong on are the centuries. You got it all mixed up. He's much more relevant today than he was in the 19th century. That enclosure process, that displacement of the peasantry, which he saw in one little corner of the world in England, is now going on on a magnitude, on a scale, as never imagined. All through Latin America, where 80, 85, 90% of your populations in countries like Uruguay, Ecuador, Mexico, now live in cities. All through Africa, South Korea, all these areas. And what you see then is capitalism reaching its advanced form, which is imperialism, moving inexorably, expanding into these other areas. That capital accumulation process of denying, uh, of denying workers alternative sources of income is going on today, and that's one of the essence of Reaganism. And the way you do that is you cut back on unemployment insurance. You cut back on child labor restrictions. You expand, you, or you, you push back the retirement age. We were talking about retiring at 62. Reagan is now talking about 67. That's a, that's a good seven, eight million workers who are kept on the job market when you go out to compete. The more workers you have on there competing, the more the price of labor, which is the commodity you're going to sell, is devalued and is cheaper. The cheaper that labor, the higher the profits. So you increase the number of workers that are out there. You cut back on disability insurance. You cut people off the disability rolls and you force them back onto the labor market. Um, you weaken labor through the uh, NLRB, uh, labor, National Labor Relations rulings, strike breaking, union busting, less unions, less able to, to com make command over wages. You cut back human services. <clears throat> that labor and that, I mean, that capital then, by the way, has a lot to do here if it were in the public domain, if we could use our wealth for public means and for social needs, we have plenty of things to do. Rebuilding our bridges, feeding our poor, putting the steel workers back to work, I mean, just cleaning up our cities, our environment, whatever else. We have plenty of work to do. 
We are now approaching a situation that has existed in third world countries. If you went to Cuba in 1958, before the socialist revolution led by Fidel Castro, whom you've all been taught by your media is an evil man out to get us. Uh, if you went to Cuba, you would have found the following. A mass of people unemployed, a great deal of illiteracy, sickness, homelessness, substandard housing, bulk of people who have never seen a doctor, a whole host of things that need to be done, just the things I just talked about, everything from building roads to getting clean drinking water in to building daycare centers and schools and all that sort of thing, and capital to do it with. But none of that happening because the control of that capital was being used for something else. That capital was being used for the interests of imperialism. And the essence of imperialism is when one nation goes in and uses the land and labor and resources of another nation for its own enrichment. More accurately, when the class of one nation goes in and expropriates the labor of another nation, often, in fact, using the taxes and the money and the sweat of its own people to do it too, as with foreign aid. The foreign aid that went to Cuba before the revolution, as the economist Ray Brown discovered when he went down there, was a hidden subsidy to the business extractive industries. The capital of Cuba was being used to raise tobacco and sugar and rum and for oil refineries because that was big money. And that money was being taken out of Cuba. The companies go into the third world and invest not to uplift the people of the third world, but to extract from them. And Ray Brown looked around and he found that all the good roads were built from the sugar plantations to the refineries to the ports. The whole infrastructure was organized around the capital accumulation process. That's what the Mexican Revolution was about. Emmanuel is a... Emman, man, I could have said it if I didn't have a call. Zapata and Pancho Villa were fighting whether the land was going to be used to grow alfalfa and beans to feed the people, or the land was going to be used for cash crop exports like sugar to, to, to make rich the latifundio owners and the big companies. That's what the fight was about. That's what the fight in most of the third world is today. And so when you hear about poor countries Remember, we're clearing up mystery after mystery here. Why they invest, the North invests in the South, and yet the South keys, keeps getting poorer. I've been hearing this for 30 years now. These dreary Sunday New York Times Magazine articles, Barbara Ward used to write one every five weeks in the Sunday Times, uh, how the North has to help the South and you know, better things, and if we can only help these people. And the assumption was that these people are, these countries are poor because there's something in their temperament, in their climate and their lack of resources. Uh, you know, that people maybe can't get it together. There's no Protestant ethic, you know, that stuff. Um, <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, the truth of the matter is there are no poor countries, very few. There are no poor countries. There are only rich countries. I look around. Brazil is rich. Bolivia is rich. Zaire is rich. Indonesia is rich, Chile is rich, South Africa is rich, the Philippines are rich. Only the people are poor. The people are poor, but those countries are rich. You ask the Mellons and Morgans and Rockefellers. Go to Appalachia, which is, used to be called the shame of our nation, the poor region of America. It's not poor, it was rich. That's how it got poor, because its fault was it was so rich. And the Rockefellers went in there and said, man, there's gold, there's black, they used to call it black gold. You know what black gold was? Coal. Coal in there. You ask the Mellons and Morgans and Rockefellers, you ask them if it's a poor area. Ask them about the millions and millions of dollars they pulled out while these poor communities huddled over these massive fortunes. And you can go in towns and see crippled guys, and you can just walk along see them in the street, maimed miners, who, the ones who survived all those years. The people are the poor, and people, the people are part of that productive resource, that raw material resource you just put in. Labor is just one of those resources whereby I can accumulate. That's what it is about the poor countries. They're not poor. For 400 years, they've been ripped off 
by the Western European and North American capitalists. For 400 years, the hemp, the flax, the indigo, the cotton, the copper, the coffee, the cocoa, the molasses, the tin, the iron, the silver, the gold, the oil, the, more recently the manganese, zinc, uranium, bauxite. That's still going on. And now they're ripping them off with something else, another thing, another commodity, that most precious of all commodities, the commodity that's used in the productive process and has that unique quality of, not, of having its value not totally consumed by the production process. The labor. I was looking over El Salvador, and I noticed that the Fortune 500, some of the top Fortune 500, about 50, 60 companies are invested in El Salvador. Chase Manhattan, Ford, Exxon, Pillsbury, Procter & Gamble, Firestone. I'm saying, what, what, what's in El, what the hell's in El Salvador? I'm looking, what do you got, a little sugar, bananas? What are they all doing there? Something else down there. It's fascism. And fascism gives you cheap labor. Fascism takes your union leaders and blows them away. They get disappeared. At least several hundred top Salvadoran union leaders have been assassinated by death squads and by a military that's financed, paid, equipped, and, and advised and, uh, by, by the United States. And what they produce are everything from electric rods to electronic machines and computers and baby powder and baking powder and, and, and rubber tires. They produce all sorts of things, none of which is then used in El Salvador, it's then shipped out. And the aid that goes to the El Salvadoran government to keep those people down comes from our pockets. You see, that's what foreign aid is, as someone, as someone once said. Foreign aid is when the poor people of a rich country, that's us, give money to the rich people of a poor country. <laughs> as in the Philippines, where the rich people of a poor country invested all in shoes then, right? <laughs> well, um, and then we pay in another way, which is the export of jobs. When General Motors closes down factories in Detroit and says we got to close them down because we're not competitive, we're, uh, people aren't buying enough cars, there's a glut, you know, Japanese, this, that. What they don't tell you is that they are investing millions of dollars and building over a dozen, over the last 10 years, over a dozen factories in other countries. They go build them in Taiwan, in these places. And when the textile industry closes down its factories in New England and moves south, because it has scab non-union labor, and when the workers in the south begin to organize because they want a better portion of the wealth they create, then they pick up and they move to South Korea. Nice little fascist country, you see. And there was an article in the New York Times about the South Korean textile workers. They're farm girls who come off the farm and they're put in these compounds and they work 12 hours a day for 18 cents an hour, seven days a week. That's what they're working in Korea. And if you want a day off to go back and see your family, you work a 24 hour, you work a double shift. That's how you get a day off. And if you step out of line, you got the goons and the clubs coming down on your head. And that's what we call stability, a firm ally, a faithful ally, a, 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 a bastion of democracy. And we hug and kiss these thugs because what they do is not make the world safe for democracy, they make it safe for hypocrisy, they make it safe for capitalism. And we use fascism to defend capitalism all the while claiming that we're saving democracy from communism. That's what imperialism is about. I'm looking for an ending here, I'm getting kind of tired. <laughs> the pay isn't that good, you know, I want to stop. <coughs> Actually, it's good for my call, I'm working up a sweat. Now, it's very hard to convince the American people. Uh, there's something else that happens with this expansion of um, into the third world, also brought into the third world are new ideas, new technologies of revolution. Gone are the 17th century Indian Yucatan rebellions where the Indians would come in and surround a, 
whatever it was, a Spanish garrison, and then dropped the siege because it was time to go home and plant corn. Which, well, they weren't foolish about it because their families would starve. They would starve if they didn't get to the planting. Gone is that. Now you get a Chinese revolutionary army which systematically rotates certain of its, of its units and organizes the people back home and knows that it would lose its peasant army at planting season to go home and guarantees that the rice is planted or the corn is planted or whatever, depending on what area they're living in. Now you have cadres, now you have vanguards, now you have people learning to organize themselves. Now you have a conscious awakening. Now you have people leading peasant revolutions with a conscious idea of how they want to organize a society. They go into Cuba and they take this country that had all these people who didn't have enough work and all these things that needed to be done. And a, a year, less than a year after the, after the revolution, now, in fact, there's more work than they can do. Now they're asking people to please donate their Saturdays and Sundays to work. Now there's roads to be built. Now there's, now there's, there's housing to be built. Now there's schools to be built. Now there are clinics to be built. There's so much work now in Cuba. The emphasis on work, work, work. The sugar harvest, let's do this or that. The students go out there in the morning, half the class goes out and they work on the orange groves and the other half goes to classes. In the afternoon they switch and late afternoon they have their common activities. The evening they do their, their, their homework. I, I, went to, I went to the campo schools, the campo schools, the field schools out in Cuba. They're mobilizing and they're doing. Now suddenly there's all this work. There's suddenly a labor shortage and a capital shortage. They have a conscious new way and that's what's so terrifying to the bourgeoisie. There has been a break in the fabric of history. There is a new way of organizing the resources of society. And they knew it, and they sensed that danger from day one. In 1917, when the Russian Revolution took place, there was a very interesting correspondence that went on between Secretary of State Lansing and Woodrow Wilson, where Lansing Turn to, uh, wrote to Wilson, he said, the Bolsheviks, that was the Russian communists, we know them today, the Bolsheviks are wanting in virtue. They preach a doctrine that would appeal to those without property and wealth. They preach that those with nothing, the lowly, can be elevated through political means rather than by individual enterprise. This would be a most unfortunate example to the common man in our country and other countries in the West. They said it. They knew it. They knew what it was about. They said, this is a danger to our class interests. It wasn't democracy they were worrying about. What democracy had there been in Tsarist Russia? It's not the tyranny of communism in Cuba. What, what democracy was there in Cuba before Castro under the butcher Batista? who went around tearing fingernails out of people's hands. And I knew a swimming guard in Havana who had it happen, held out his hands and said, look, this is what happened when, under Batista. When the Batista thugs came into the University of Havana and, and, and lined up the whole swimming team because they were, they were, uh, they were um, the students in the university were, were, were um, suspected of, not suspected, they were very active politically and, and, and tortured these guys and pulled out their fingernails and all that. What, what democracy was there then? So not to defend democracy. So communism didn't come along and take away freedoms these people never had. What communism has done in Cuba, though, is given them at least some modicum of security. Cubans today have something which Americans don't have yet, and that's a national health insurance. They have free medical care. Cubans today have something which Americans don't have yet, which is a guaranteed right to an education, whether you can pay for it or not. And they have a right that we don't have yet, which is a right to a home. You don't find, it's a poor country, as Fidel Castro said. Our country, you'll come here and you'll find paint peeling off the buildings and lines sometimes for some of the quality consumer goods and all, but you won't find any kids begging in the streets and you won't find anybody sleeping in the gutters. That's something, that's freedom, to be free of that. When you go around here, how free do you think we are? You meet people in their 40s and their, and their preoccupation in their 50s. I'm talking about people making 50, 60,000 a year, worried about their retirement. Will they end up in a little furnished room with a raw electric bulb, or will they uh, be able to still have a place they can live and take a vacation once in a while and go to a restaurant, maintain their standard of living? It plagues people. It constantly plagues. Um, 
So freedom is, to some degree, you see, has a class dimension to it. And if you go to Cuba and you talk to the campesino and you say to him, are you free? He says, see, I get up now, I go to my CDR, and I can complain and I can argue about this, that, and the other thing. By the way, you're not free in Cuba to criticize the socialist system. If you do that, then you're in trouble. You cannot criticize the system as a system. But within that system, you can argue about policy and planning. There's more political discussion going on there than there is in the United States, where people seem to be numbed by their, by their TV sets. And, they, and politics is passed off for those races that go on, those horse races. Who's going to win? Who's not going to win? What his chances are? What his chances are? The actual discussion of actual public policy of the kinds of issues I've been touching on today is almost non-existent, both in the public and private sphere in America. And you see that kind of thing. You see people getting up who didn't believe that they had a right to learn how to read, now reading, now take, making decisions over their own lives in the factories, working in their unions, and this campesino points up to the hill. He says, look what we got there. And there's this beautiful clinic right up in the middle of the Escambray, which is the most rugged, was the poorest part of Cuba. He says, that clinic was a full-time doctor. And he tells you a story of how before the revolution, when someone got seriously sick, some 20 people would have to carry that person, taking turns, going day and night, because it would take two days to get to a hospital. First, because the hospital was so far away, and second, you had to take a very circuitous route, because if you crossed the lat latifundio, you'd get shot by the latifundio owner, so you couldn't touch his trespass over his territory. And you often got to the hospital, and the guy would be dead. And now we got this clinic with a full-time doctor and an incubator in case of premature birth or something, and a dentist who comes one day a week. And if you've got a real emergency toothache, you're never, you're never more than 20 minutes away from a, from a larger hospital. That's the goal of the Cubans. The goal of the Cuban health policy is to be sure that no Cuban is more than 20 minutes away in terms of transportation from a, a full, fully staffed hospital. very simply that I'm on the other side. I'm on the side of those who want justice, who want fairness, whose values are not dedicated to the capital accumulation process, but whose values are dedicated to, to, um, to building that kind of clinic up in the hills. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Okay, sure. Thank you. Are there questions or, or comments of your own you would like to bring up? Please do. Yes, sir. My solution is uh, to, uh, we see when you use the word solution, it's the wrong word. Solution, after all, is a quick one answer. What's the solution to this problem? Two plus two, ah, four, you know. Uh, obviously, uh, history doesn't have those kind of, doesn't have solutions in that sense. But history does sort of point the way. There is a process of struggle going on. Um, all through the Third World and other places. This is what's so dangerous about Nicaragua. It's a terrible example of a new way of doing things, of a new way of organizing the land, labor, and resources and technology of a country. Um, the solution is to work and struggle in that direction. It can be very discouraging at times, but you shouldn't get too discouraged. You must have what that great Italian communist Antonio Gramsci said, you must have a pessimism of the mind and an optimism of the will. After all, the pessimism of the mind, the analysis I gave you was a very grim one. But it, you see and you cut through things. But the optimism of the will is that you can change and you can fight back. I uh, remember in... Um, Uh, in, um, I got a big microphone in this pocket. <laughs> I thought I had a handkerchief. I remember 
Let me give you an example. In, uh, in 1983, I was asked by some Filipino nuns if I would talk at a demonstration at the White House, at Lafayette Park, across the street from the White House. I went, I did a lot of, when I lived in Washington for six years, I did a lot of talking at the White House from across the street, it's microphones. So I used to tell my friends, I'm, I'm talking at the White House. And they said, you're talking at the White House? Yes, talking at the White House. <laughs> <coughs> so I went down there and I talked, I gave a sort of, I don't know what they called it, like a commemor, I don't know what it was. It's like a salutation. It was some kind of a thing I had to do. And I kind of, I made it very political, but I also did it in the, in the kind of way they wanted, you know, we hope, try, a lot of that kind of moral thing that Filipino nuns like, but they're very political. <laughs> they're also very, po sorry, Father. They're also very political. They're also very political, very organized. And here was this group we had in Lafayette Park, 200, about 200 people about, I'd say maybe half Filipino, half American marching around Lafayette Park because Marcos was coming to visit his massa, right, Ronald Reagan. And across the street there at the White House, here's our little band of 200 people with a brave little signs and walking along. And I give this talk and they were so appreciative of my coming. It was very moving for me, you know. And I did this and all. Then I look across the street and what do I see? I see 500 cops. What there? Batons in there, riot gear, and yeah, this and that, guns and uh, uh, cops like this. You know, saying, you know life, Oscar Wilde said, life imitates art. They all watch television and they're like that, you know. <laughs> and so, they're, and they're all, and there's cops all over there against this very fierce threat of these 200 people, right, uh, who still believe in the First Amendment, who are exercising, all right. And behind that are these army of limousines, you see. And the limousines are bringing Marcos up to the front door. There's those limousines. And all the cameras and all the lights going whoop, whoop, whoop. And the cameras are all pointing that way. Nothing at us, nothing to reach the American people with our message, but all there to show Marcos and Reagan hugging and kissing him and telling and saying, what a great defender of democracy you are, Ferdinand. What a wonderful oh, democracy. Oh, I love your democracy. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm looking at this situation and our pathetic little band and all this power and Filipino heavies, Marco's own plain clothesmen. You see these guys, they were Filipinos, standing around like that, the little clusters, checking out the crowd, looking at the Filipinos, anybody they recognize. And I start to do what people often do in a situation like that. I start to bleed inside. And I say, my God, my God, I, I feel I'm a liar to these people. I'm saying courage, faith, fight back, truth, justice, we're going to win. My God, and I want to just cry because look at all this power and wealth over there and look at our pathetic little band over here. And then I wander over to the gate where some of our people had put up a display. And you know what the display consisted of? Of photographs of Filipinos dead on the side of the road or found, tortured, with their faces blown up in different kinds of colors that no human face should ever have. And I'm looking at this and I'm really dying and I'm saying, my God, what the hell? What kind of a world is this? What are we going to do? Look what they're doing to us. And a Filipino honcho, one of these heavies, comes over playing clothesman and he walks over like this and he looks at the pictures and he yawns. He goes, and he goes, like that. And if I ever wanted to really give someone a kick in the ass, I can't tell you I had that impulse, but I, over, I outgrew those years, I wouldn't do it. So, <laughs> well, funny thing though, three years later, three years later, this indomitable situation, this Marcos, you know, this whole system, now that system is still pretty much intact. It's true they just changed the guy in the hope of preserving the system. But one reason the Americans jettisoned him, the only reason they jettisoned him, because whereas before he was thought of as a instrument of stability, and stability is a code, code word for all the things I've just been describing, the poverty, the misery, the cheap wages, the, ex the exploitation of their resources and all that, and keeping them all in line, and the reason you give these countries these big armies is not to defend them from other invasions. Taiwan isn't going to invade the Philippines. Uruguay isn't going to invade Bolivia. 
Chile isn't going to invade Argentina. They all got these big armies, not to defend themselves, their security from other countries, but to defend themselves from their own people. And that object of stability had become so corrupt, so rotten, so exploitative, so abusive, that he was becoming another Shah, another Somoza. He was actually mobilizing the whole people against them. He was now becoming an object of instability, a liability, and so they jettisoned him. So you can say, well, it wasn't then the revolution that got rid of Marcos, it was the U.S. But the only reason the U.S. did it was because they were afraid of the revolution. They were afraid of the democratic forces that were moving and in action. They get afraid when nuns with rosary beads can stop tanks. They get afraid because their only line of defense finally are those tanks. And suddenly you realize that power is turning around, that this thing which seems so indomitable, so powerful, that brought me almost to tears of anger and grief is suddenly now cracking and breaking apart. That's what history is about. Power is a funny thing. Do the people have power? To ask if the people have power is a little bit like asking, does Saudi Arabia have oil? We are, in fact, the stuff of power. We are the raw material itself. It's just that other people have been extracting it and refining it for their purposes, their power and profit. I like that. It's a good metaphor. Um, <clears throat> so what happens then, those who were so once so indomitable and whose agents were everywhere, whose bayonets were everywhere, whose electric shock torture machines were everywhere, whose death squads were everywhere, whose army and helicopters were everywhere, suddenly they are flicked off as a stallion might flick off a fly. So, um, um, and it's those kind of examples that do make them very uncomfortable. It's not clear what's going to happen in the Philippines, but we may have unleashed something. I don't believe Mrs. Aquino is a, is a Duarte. See, Duarte was the same kind of thing. Quick, quick come up with an election, legitimate it, say we got a new face there in El Salvador. But Duarte is just a puppet. I mean, he has no, he has no, his own Christian Democratic Party. Most of the Christian Democratic Party has joined the FSLM. He was from the right wing of the Christian Democratic Party. Napoleon, Jose Napoleon Duarte, I saw a documentary on him about seven years ago before nobody who knew who Duarte was. Not on him, but it was on El Salvador, but he was in it. He was already apologizing. He was apologizing then from his lips, the death squads. He was covering, apologizing for them. And that election was between an apologist of the death squads named Duarte and a practitioner of the death squads named uh, Dabousson, you see. And Duarte was the more moderate one, and he won the election. That was a phony, a phony election where voting with ballots were not secret and voting was required. And if your schedule, it's called, didn't show that you voted, you get shot dead. In fact, people were executed for not having voted. Um, but I think Aikino is something else because there are real popular forces that have been unleashed here and are in motion. There are things happening, you see. The Marcos judges are being kicked out. The parliament was disbanded. Um, uh, there are going to be certain kinds of reforms taking place. And this may not bring, uh, this may be real democratic gains. The gains in Haiti are, are democratic gains in a way. You can't say nothing's happened in Haiti. The same, the same system is still in power. Not quite. You know, last year the Tonton Makut in Haiti go out and kill people for fun. There was a, there was a time story about a, about a reporter went to his restaurant and said, where's my favorite waitress? And the guy said, oh, I'm sorry, monsieur. She, uh, the other day she stepped outside and the Tonton Makut came along and the, one of their jeeps, and they looked, they said, hey, look at the pretty girl, and they, and they blasted her dead. They shot her dead. And now today, the Tonton Makut are being hunted down like the rats they are. They're being hunted down, and they're being shot as they should be. Um, so there are changes taking place, and changes do take place. The one thing about history is it does not stand still. There's no, nothing, nothing about history that stands still. It may move tumultuously and riotously at certain moments, or deeply and quietly at other moments, but it moves, you know. The, the, trickle, the trickle moves quietly in a raucous history, and it, um, it turns into a tide, and then one day the soldiers look the other way, or they melt into the crowd, drawn by the pounding of a million footsteps. And that's what's going to, that, that's what I think is the future. The future will be like the past or the present, unless it all gets blown up before, you know. Yeah.
Yeah, the solution is socialism, a democratic, democratic socialism, a non-sexist, non-racist, ecologically minded, public ownership, non-profit socialism, where people could work and not live off other people's labor, and where we can take our immense wealth and the beauty of this country and use it and direct it toward human values. That's the solution. As to how you get there, of course, I, I say there's no one pure blueprint. But I'd rather know what I want and not quite know how to get there than know how to get there and not know where I'm going, which is the essence of capitalism. It just goes and goes and goes. It has no, has no end but itself. Yeah. Wait, just a minute. That gentleman. Yeah. Did you just arrive? Oh, in the back. Oh, okay. All right. I'll, I'll, then I'll call on you. All right. Yeah. Wait, just a minute. <laughs> well, the war against Libya, the attack against Libya have been going on there, a media hype. In 1982, the media was absolutely filled with news that there were two Libyan death squads that were coming, hit squads, and coming into the U.S. to assassinate President Reagan. And we were treated to spectacles of helicopters and the Secret Service men running along limousines and all sorts of things and all these measures. And the New York Times and the Washington Post both had composite pictures of what these guys were all supposed to look like. Turns out there's no such thing. There's no evidence of their existence. William Webster of the FBI testified before Senate committee. He said, we have no evidence that these death squads ever uh, can't entered US borders, which means they had no evidence of the death squads. As it turned out, he asked me, Do you, have you seen it? And my known? There was a big media hype that kept popping up. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the attack on Libya was supposed to be in response to the attack on the West Berlin disco. Reagan says he has irrefutable evidence that the Libyans were involved. If he has irrefutable evidence, why didn't he make it public? They never were, they, they never were hesitant to make public non-existent evidence, like these pictures of these death squad people. Why didn't they make public the evidence of the death squad. The West Germans say the evidence was hardly convincing. The one, one West German official I heard speaks, the evidence was hardly convincing. In, in fact, it's non-existent as far as we know. Assuming the Libyans did do that hit in West German disco, which they may very well, they could say this was in response to the attack on the Gulf of Cedrip where the Libyans lost 50 lives. Now, we could say the attack on the Gulf of Cedra is in response, and we did say, to the attacks on the Vienna and Rome airports, which we and the media repeatedly blamed on Libyans, which it turns out wasn't from Libya at all. Those terrorists operated from Syria or Lebanon. Jeffrey Kemp, who was Ronald Reagan's Middle East expert for at least four years, said that Libya runs a poor third to Syria and Iran as far as backing or financing terrorists. But the focus is on Libya. Libya, 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 and your brains are getting jerked around. You go out here, all Americans are we had to hit them back. We got to do it. We got to show them. We got to show them we're strong. We really got to demonstrate that we're stronger than Libya? We really got to demonstrate? The only people in the world who are anxious and worried that the Americans aren't strong are the Americans. Everyone else thinks we're too goddamn strong. They burn our flags, they hate us, they feel like an elephant stepping on their chest. We really have to demonstrate that we could hit the Gulf of Sidra? <laughs> and so we hit these three terrorist centers and kill enough men, women, and children who are training in these, this one-year-old baby training in this terrorist center, was what the media call it, man. I was out in Denver at the time. The Denver Post said, terrorist centers hit by US jets. That was it. Those are terrorist centers. Turns out to be people's homes and compounds where they live. Um, the real danger of Gaddafi is that in 1969, he led a colonel's revolt 
in a country that was like Saudi Arabia, that is with a mass of poverty and a small clique up there with more wealth, more Cadillacs, more summer homes, more petrodollars than they knew what the hell to do with, more thoroughbreds, more, more squander and whatever else. And the colonels came in and got rid of that small class, just kicked them the hell out. And they went off to their backup homes in, on the Riviera and other places like that. Those are his Libyan, the freedom, fighters for freedom, who are now talked about as uh, the people with the back, who now live in Paris and Riviera and London, a place like that. And he then took that country and he started to invest. First of all, he got a bigger chuck, uh, cut of the oil revenues, which is already a no-no. And then he started to invest those revenues into his own country, building roads, building housing. He took the second, third, and fourth homes of the rich and had them occupied by people. He started farm co-ops. He started these, this whole system of people's assemblies where people get up and make decisions about their own production. He, had, he allowed women to go to school, including officers, candidate school in the army. He planted 40 million trees. And he's also not a very politic, politic and diplomatic person. He's given, he has a pension for dramatic postures and, and sweeping statements which play right into Ronald Reagan's hands, talking about the line of death and, and, uh, and all that. By the way, the media will pick that up when Colonel Gaddafi says there's a line of death here on the Gulf. You know, I draw this line and you may not cross it. And Reagan, of course, is going to take the dare and crosses it, he's going to show. Um, but that'll get picked up by the media. What doesn't get picked up is the fact that Gaddafi has repeatedly offered to negotiate all differences that might exist with Ronald Reagan. Why not negotiate with him? See, one of the things about Ronald Reagan is he won't take yes for an answer. Look at his dealings with the Russians. He won't take yes. Gorbachev says, look, we'll put the ICBMs on the table. Unilateral moratorium on, on underground testing. Stop all nuclear testing. Because Gorbachev knows if you stop all nuclear testing, you stop all nuclear weapons. That's the end. You can't develop new weapons, and we can't keep going up and up. And that's in the Soviet interest. Because they have a capital shortage, not a capital surplus like here, which, which gets rich off defense contracts. They have a labor shortage, not like a labor, labor surplus here, where we've got 25 million underemployed in any one year. They have a planned economy, not a glut economy and a starvation economy as we have here. So every new jet or missile or tank they build, that's one less subway car or subway system they could build. In the Soviet Union, any city which reaches a million people in population gets a subway system built. Um, the thing about Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, when Hitler and Mussolini came into power, there's always so much debate on who supported Hitler, which class, this, that. They never debate what class was interest, what class interests were favored when they came into power. When Hitler came into power, what he did was immediately cut, uh, abolish labor unions, abolish opposition newspapers, cut back on wages, cut inheritance taxes to the rich, increase cartel profits. Mussolini did the same thing in, in Italy, brought back child labor in Italy. Um, things which the Italians thought they had left behind a generation before came surging back. All the social gains they thought they had made before. That's the Reagan, that's the Reagan goal too, which is to bring back uh, that sort of thing. So which class interest is favored? And I think in the Soviet Union, you don't have a ruling class by the definition I, I gave. That in the sense that, well, I think, I think you don't have total equality, but you don't. You see, nobody in the Soviet Union can inherit the means of production. Nobody, even when you make a lot of money, for instance, uh, Shostakovich made a lot of money on all his records and such. Um, that uh, he can't make he can't make money off you can't use that money to make money off other people's labor you can have it in the bank but you don't get interest on it and that sort of thing and uh, and the privileges that you, that you have at least when I was in the Soviet Union and observed it I saw where Brezhnev and Andropov had lived it's a big kind of dumpy housing housing project near the Kremlin that's where the leaders live and Andropov had a Five and a half room apartment. All right, that's a little bit more. He was a bachelor, it's true. But he was the leader, he was the general, sec he was the general secretary of the USSR. He also had a car that came and picked him up. So what, a guy was pushing 70 years old. He'd have to go downstairs and hail a cab every morning to get to the Kremlin. Um, 
th th that's not true that the leaders of the Soviet Union own the means of production, have vast resources. There are some fancy dachas where they do vacation, where they, uh, where they uh, entertain foreign heads of states. But most dachas, means of people have dachas in the Soviet Union. They're summer homes. They're, they're like little cottages. I saw those too, all over and outside of Leningrad. Yeah, the privilege, the, the perks, I'm saying, the perks are really minimal. The perks are that you don't have to stand in line because you can go to the small party store. But in terms of consumer goods, I went to a party store. It was nothing compared to Goom, the big, if you want real consumerism, you have to go with Goom, the big, the big department stores where the stuff is. But what the, the advantage of the, of the party store was party people work extra hours, and they do, besides your regular job, your party work is something separate from your government work. And is that you can go in and you can get faster service. That's the big deal. There are, there, are, there are perks and minor advantages. That does not add up to a class exploitation and expropriation of the surplus value of the workers. And meanwhile, what you got is the things I said before. You, got, you, have in the, you, have, you do have this in the USSR. You have workers who cannot pay more than 7, no, no, 4% of their salary for rent, not more than 4%. The price of bread has not changed since 1928. The price of riding on a subway is seven cents, five kopecks. And, and you have... He wanted to from Moscow. There is no butter, no meat. If every day, millions of people from all Russia came to Moscow to buy the food. Well, there's a lot more meat. No butter, no meat, even no sausage. No, there's got to be milk. Well, wait a minute, got to be milk, because the milk... The milk all right, I have to, if you got to let me answer you again, all right? The Soviet Union happens to be the largest producer of, uh, of dairy products in the world today, and they have now tripled their meat production. By the way, that's why they import grain from the U.S. There's an awful propaganda that they can't feed their people. They, in fact, have a grain surplus, but they need yet more grain. They use most of it for fodder. What they don't have in the Soviet Union is, is those tremendous great soybean fields and, and the great plains that we have. Uh, in the USSR, not more than about 7 or 8 percent of the land surface is suitable for agriculture. Most of it is either too arid or too cold for agriculture. So they, they got shortchanged on agriculture really bad. The richest agricultural nation in the world is the US. There's no, there's no land, no stretch of continent not in Brazil, not in China, not in Africa, nowhere. Like what you have on the, what goes from Appalachia right across to the Rockies and then all of California. We have, we have a richness, and that was the foundation of our prosperity. Um, we sell more grain to the Benelux countries in Western Europe and West Germany than we do to the Soviet Union. But you never read in the newspapers that, 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 that Belgium or West Germany can't feed their people. The system can't feed their people in capitalist West Germany. They import grain too. But most of the grain the Soviets import are for, um, is for fodder because they have tripled their meat production. They believe, unfortunately and correctly, that more meat in the diet is a better diet Despite, both East and West seem to be of one mind on that, that you've improved your diet. CIA reports talk about the Soviet Union has improved its diet because they're all eating more meat and dairy and butter. Uh, the best medical evidence points out that, in fact, low meat, low dairy, low butter is better for your health, uh, which may explain why in the USSR, in fact, heart attacks are now going up and all that sort of thing. Uh, they're paying the price of prosperity. I'd like to go on to another question. One more quick question. One more question. No. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I, I guess I guess you and I are gonna not see eye to eye on this one. Yeah, yeah. They're not purposely excluded. If anything, they'd like to expand the size of the Communist Party. There's about 14 million adults in the Communist Party. 14 million adults, would that be 6% only? I don't know. Um, uh, you see, you have, to be over, you have to be over the age of 27 to be in the party. So I don't believe it's 6%, only 6%. I, th I think it's more like, uh, oh, I don't know, I would say, well, wait a minute, I can tell you. 
about, it's one out of every eight adults. That's not 6%, that's more like uh, 16, or, or, or uh, what would be one out of eight? 12. 12%, okay, it's 12% of the people are in the Communist Party. Uh, you're, not, you're not excluded from the party. Anybody can apply. A lot of people are sympathetic to the party. By the way, when you go, my guide, uh, one of the guys, uh, George, we asked him, why don't, you, why don't you join the party, George? He says, because he's totally sympathetic to the party. In his description of the Communist Party, he says, you mustn't think of the party as a little coterie. The party is people all over. You can have doctors, you can have people uh, in the factories, uh, all over. There's sort of the eyes and ears. Uh, and, and they respond to complaints, and they and they are kind of a nerve nerve endings of the society. This is the way he described it. I said, "Why don't you join the party?" He said, "I don't want to get up at seven in the morning, six thirty in the morning, and spend an hour uh, at the meetings and have to do this and then take on party tasks and all that." He said, "I work too hard as it is as a guide, and I just don't want to do." It. So there's a lot of people who are perfectly sympathetic to the Communist Party, but who don't join because it's a it's a tough it's a hard it's a tough commitment to be a member of the party. Uh, I know the camera and news crew of the East German, East German camera news crew in Washington, D.C., uh, Otto Jorg and Klaus Schulz and, and their wives, that, that help, I don't have to give everybody's names, but uh, they, um, they're communists in their perceptions and in their feelings about their society and the way they feel and they like their society and all that, but they're not members of the party. And again, for the same reason, they just find that that's too much. Jorg puts in a 12, 13 hour day as a correspondent already, and so he just feels he doesn't want to be in it. And, and other people, for all sorts of other reasons, don't join the party. But it's hard, rather than excluding people from joining the party, it's not like Democrats, Republicans. Here you go in and you can sign the little register. I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, you sign a check. It doesn't mean anything, you don't do anything. Rather than excluding people, they would like more people to join. Okay, um, this is another whole lecture. If you get the funds, I'll come back and we can have a debate next time, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much.